Hello. This is an A-level revision guide to Howard's End. Now, if you follow my videos, you'll know that the way I generally like to read a novel is to start with the plot and how the characters respond to their circumstances. And then I'll factor in aspects of the writing, such as imagery and the way the story is told. And I like to consider what insights I get from the novel and the extent to which I want to identify with or distance myself from the point of view of the novel. So I'll start with the plot of Howard's End. What are the characters trying to do? How are they responding to their circumstances? Well, Helen seems to want an engagement with Paul Wilcox and then just as quickly not want it. And this immediately raises the question of what is a respectable woman to do in England in 1910? Should she give herself away? Should she marry herself off to some red-blooded eligible bachelor from the landed gentry? She explains very clearly why she didn't want to go through with this. I felt for a moment that the whole family was a fraud, just a wall of newspapers and motor cars and golf clubs, and that if it fell, I should find nothing but panic and emptiness. What exactly she means by this does not become clear until chapter 5, when Helen's listening to the Beethoven Symphony. Unlike the others at the concert, Helen turns the music into a story. She can hear heroes and shipwrecks in the music's flood. In the second movement, she hears, first of all, the goblins, and then a trio of elephants dancing. It seems that the perfect melodies people plan for their lives can be disrupted by goblin forces. And throughout the whole novel, these goblins appear, proving Helen right, from the purloined umbrella to the chance encounter of Jackie and Henry, to the imperial sword at the end. So what Helen is recognising about the Wilcox family is that without the sophisticated understanding of the whole symphony of life, with its heroic melodies and its shipwrecking goblins, men like the Wilcoxes are vulnerable to making mistakes and panicking, and are likely to create emptiness rather than a fulfilled and valuable world. So it's interesting, despite the fact that Helen comes across as quite an impulsive character, she is the one who hears the whole symphony. She's the one who sees both the heroes and the shipwrecks. And this is why I think, at the end, it's Helen and her son who will end up living at Howard's End, who will end up inheriting England, and not people like Charles Wilcox, who ends up with an empty life in prison when he panics on meeting Leonard Bast at Howard's End. Okay, so we were talking about why Helen doesn't want to get engaged to Paul or to any Wilcox. Paul, for his part, by the way, is just as reticent. It seems to be almost embarrassing for him. His family, and indeed his class, expect him to be a red-blooded man of action who shouldn't be giving in to emotions or romantic feelings when his role is to establish himself in the administration of empire. But Helen's sister, Margaret, in time comes to understand that she does want to connect and she accepts a marriage proposal from Henry Wilcox. Now critics, if I leave us particularly, have not found this marriage very plausible, essentially because Henry lacks the caring qualities Margaret values. But Margaret sees him as a man of standing and she's flattered by his interest. She's also about to lose Wickham Place, she feels lonely, she's worried about becoming an old maid, and Henry's helping her. Moreover, she thinks she can change him. And in her motto of only connect, she recognises the critical fact that all their carefree life of cultural pursuits is entirely dependent on the work of the Wilcoxes. If Wilcoxes hadn't worked and died in England for thousands of years, you and I could not sit here without having our throats cut. There would be no trains, no ships to carry us literary people about in, no fields even, just savagery. This, of course, is an important and accurate recognition of the way of life of her entire Rodier class. She stands on islands of money, money she's never had to work for, money that's handed down from the work of previous generations, money that's been made by people very much like the Wilcoxes. As an example of the useless Rodier class, look at Tibby. He buries himself in academia, eating his apple charlottes, never does a stroke of work, never has any useful opinions, never makes any contribution to society. Margaret turns out to be mistaken about the idea that she can simply change Henry. She finds it hard to get him to connect, 
This is because in conducting a life that has involved running an exploitative colonial firm, the West African Rubber Company, and taking advantage of vulnerable 16-year-old girls such as Jackie, Henry Wilcox has developed a different motto, concentrate. What he presumably means by this is that he will focus on, the, on his narrow self-interest and therefore not notice anything which shows up the inconsistencies or hypocrisy of his actions. In a novel whose epigraph is only connect, it turns out that very few people are actually making real connections. Forster's class consciousness is also very relevant to the third main character, Len Bast. He responds to his circumstances by trying to improve himself, reading Ruskin, attending Beethoven concerts. But the novel is clear that he will not succeed. If you remember the ending, Bast is killed by a combination of the books falling upon him and the Schlegel's father's imperial sword, which is wielded by Charles Wilcox. In this sense, the novel's message is quite a socialist one. The class system is portrayed as poisonous. The upper class will cause damage to those less fortunate than themselves by colonialism, by exploitation, and by the sword. Forster, of course, is offering us a detailed study of how people aspire to joining or connecting with different classes. It's not a comprehensive socialist picture, though, because as the narrator famously informs us, we're not concerned with the very poor. This may well be because Forster did not have enough experience of the abyss himself to be able to write convincingly about it. But the novel nonetheless comes from the liberal tradition. So in this first step, by looking at how characters respond to their circumstances, we can identify that the most prominent concern of the novel is the class system and the relationships between classes. Even in this brief introduction, we've identified a thread of argument that goes something like this that the imperialists, though they have created the economy, have concentrated on their own self-interest and are blind to the goblins that will disrupt the social hierarchy. Culture can point the way to a more open and connected understanding and this will lead to a more equitable sharing of power and wealth between the classes. Okay, now, if that sounded bold and simplistic, that's because this is just a five-minute introduction to help with revision. But the sentiment about class in the novel is something like that. Uh, anyway, th that's it for now. My next video on Howard's End will look at its use of language and narrative voice. Goodbye for now.